You're listening to Cloud Security Reinvented, a podcast for security leaders with a focus on the cloud. Learn best practices from fellow security professionals and how they disconnect from it all at the end of the day. Cloud Security Reinvented. Good morning, or depending on when you are in the world, good afternoon, good evening, or good night. Welcome to Cloud Security Reinvented. I'm your host, Andy Ellis. Before I introduce our guest for the week, a quick word from our sponsor, Orca Security. Orca provides agentless security and compliance for your public cloud infrastructure, enabling you to detect and prioritize security risks in minutes, not months. I'm here today with Meg Anderson, CISO at Principal Financial Group. Welcome, Meg. Thank you, Andy. Great to be here. Thanks for joining me today. You know, across a long security career, hopefully we as professionals grow, but the world that we're in changes and we often need to adapt to that. So today I'd like to get some insight from you and we're gonna focus on the transition from the on-premise world that we all started in to the world of cloud that has increasingly become the default model for IT infrastructure. But first I wanna chat a little bit about your career journey, which is actually one of the more unusual ones, not in that you did like 85 different things, but you basically have been in one place. You know, I used to think my tenure at Akamai, which was 21 years, was long, but you've got me beat by 13 years and counting. So you get to see how that landscape changes the same organization. So what's that been like from IT into security and moving up the, the corporate ladder in one place? Sure, you're right. It'll be 35 years for me in June. I, I graduated with an MIS degree and I really intended to be a systems analyst, or in other words, I never really wanted to be a programmer. And back in the late 80s, the IT field was just booming. It's very similar to how it is today, right? I had my second interview and an offer in hand later that day. So I, I joined Principal back then. I worked in the health insurance technology team, and I began my career with a different C word, COBOL, not cloud. So oh I was my a God. COBOL programmer. And uh, I have to say, I was an okay programmer, but I went on to work honing my skills and technology leadership, designing systems. The company was changing a ton. There was so much growth in technology back in the 80s and 90s, and there was never a short of challenges, which kept me at principle engaged and, and continuously learning things. So that health in insurance experience also gave me insight into things like HIPAA and various yep. state privacy laws, a lot of data security things were happening at the time. And I found that interesting, but that was the extent of my security domain knowledge. So after about 20 years in the, the health insurance IT team, and in fact, we don't sell health insurance any longer, but I decided it was time to learn another part of the company. And the CISO seat happened to be vacant. I was the second CISO at principal, also the second female mm -hmm. CISO, by the way. And I decided to, to interview for that position and got it. So I will tell you, looking back on a, on a scale of one to 10, my experience level for that job was a, a one. But like you said, it was a very different job back in 2008 was when I took the, took the job. Yep. And cybersecurity was just starting to be in the headlines, but it wasn't a daily occurrence at that point, maybe weekly. Things were starting to happen with regard to regulations. But getting from that experience level of one to where I'm at today, I just had so many people helping me along the way, both inside the company as well as outside the company, peer groups. It's just been a very powerful force multiplier for me. And in fact, Andy, you probably don't recall, but I think I met you for the first time at a CSO conference. You were on stage and I was in the audience. <laughs> that was would have been the, the back when it was the CSO 40 awards, I suspect. It probably was. I do remember you had some very interesting shoes on. Yep, yep. The back on of wore the uh, five room, five fingers. You got but it. You know what I really, what I really like about that story is that acknowledgement that you really weren't able, ready to do the CISO job, but you were ready to grow into it. And I think when we talk to a lot of people about one of the challenges in the skills gap today, it's this: people put create jobs that look like nobody can do it. And people feel like they shouldn't apply if they're not able to already do the job rather than apply for a job they can grow into. So I'm glad to see that like you made that transition and people can say, oh, look, if Meg did it, like that's a path that might work. Yep. So for you, like you actually went from paper to tech 
and then tech to cloud. And so you've done like this transition multiple times. And even when we say tech, there's probably like, you know, from mainframes to distributed systems. But how has security changed if you, as you've approached it? Like, what's different now than maybe 10 years ago, just about how you approach security? Yeah, I think we had some time to think differently when we started to move into software as a service. So we had to explicitly understand what we controlled, what we configured, what the vendor controlled, how to, how to verify that they were working in a secure way. In some cases, we had to make sure that the software included encryption or multi-factor authentication, for example, and understanding that the people purchasing that software chose those features because oftentimes those were an add-on feature. They cost more money. And so mm -hmm. understanding the world of SaaS, I think, really helped us think about our level of control, not just security, but even the engineering features and capabilities. And and one of the things that I, I think came out of that was broader acknowledgement of how your IT community is useful to collaborate more with user groups outside of the company and to really put pressure or to help shape vendor roadmaps. So I, yep. I think there was a little bit more of uh, security features. We're moving in the direction that the crowd wanted them to move into or the customers of the vendor needed it to. So I think that was really beneficial. Now with platform as a service and infrastructure as a service, we're all in learning mode. That includes mm -hmm. not just engineers, not security team, but leaders and auditors, regulators, all the people on my security team, myself, of course. So previously there was a lot of expertise related to the data center security stack, processes we used, how we assessed risk, but it's all changed and, and we're transforming our workloads and moving to the cloud a lot of upskilling is taking place and that, and there's no sort of end in sight for that either. So it's this constant pressure to learn new things. I happen to think that that's really exciting. Cloud's definitely yep. a continuum and we'll keep improving along the journey, but that can be an adjustment for security teams because they're comparing the traditional layered security from on-premises with a new way to think about defense in depth. It's not once and done. There's definitely more ownership by the cloud team, the cloud engineers, as compared to relying on specialists that were previously in the infrastructure team. So I think some of the, the building security left conversation that we've had over the last decade or more is something that we really need to keep our eye on because that automation is critical to help integrate security into the deployment pipelines, allowing engineers to own their code, the security of the code, that's that's a change that I think at least we are in the midst of here at Principal. Others have come before us. Others will come after us. But I think that's probably some of the biggest changes that I'm seeing. Yeah, and, uh, you know, it's a really insightful. I hadn't thought about that. But given that the technology underneath that we're built upon is always now moving, whereas before we got to control that pace, like you could choose not to take OS updates and you, know, you could choose not to upgrade your data center. But if AWS upgrades underneath you, you have to sort of adapt to those changes. You're right. So if I I look from the outside at a lot of industries, and I suspect it's always different on the inside. And so for your industry, like how is it different? How's cloud security different than what outsiders would expect and just assume is happening? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I don't know if I have a great answer, but I, I think the most important difference at principle in particular is the agility that we need really relies on cooperation and collaboration between developers, the security team, operations, all other people. So at principle, what I think is different when I think about cloud security is there's not an adversarial relationship. We're all learning, we're all respectful, you know, obviously yep. I say all, sometimes there's, you know, conflicts that occur, but we get through them. And, and I think that that culture is really important from a financial services sector. You know, one of the things that I think about is there's a lot of money being invested in financial services for digital transformation. And when there's a yep. lot of money invested, you have a lot of executive attention to it, board as, as well, shareholders. So there's a great amount of focus on keeping things secure, making sure our customer information stays secure, 
So there's a, that foundational imperative to do it right while we move quickly. So that tone at the top is really important. I suspect longevity in your role specifically plays a lot into that non-adversarial relationship that you have a lot of relationships that your organization can leverage and people know what's going on. It's not like, oh, we got you know, the new CISO of the month who's coming in to change everything to their style. Yeah, I would say I would say there's some truth to that, although, you know, our company is over 140 years old and we pride ourselves on our culture. And I think that it's deserved. Our roots were in a, a mutual company, so very mm -hmm. collegial atmosphere. And at the core of our mission is really to make sure we're doing the right things. And I believe people believe that here. So working together, making sure things stay secure, making sure we hit deadlines, it's kind of all part of what we're doing. Yep. That's great to hear. So if I look at how practices have changed, What's a practice from the pre-cloud era that really still resonates today for moving to the cloud that people shouldn't abandon? You know, two of the things throughout my career that I, I think I've continuously been investing in both talent and technology and tools are around access control and data protection. So I think those practices really need to be top of mind as we continuously expand in the cloud. They have to be very intentionally thought about, intentionally architected. The cloud brings new ways, of course, to think about identity and access management. There's new tools to do it with. But in the end, we really still need to make sure that the right people have access to the right information, the right time, mm -hmm. and we can't lose sight of that. And our customers trust that we'll protect their information and money no matter where we're doing our computing. So it's not a choice. And, and those things I think I would lead with. Yeah, I think there's a, a key piece that I was speaking with some startups recently in the data protection space. And one of the comments that, that I hadn't really thought about is we got this sort of nascent protection in the pre-cloud world because it was data was so big that people couldn't replicate all of your production data. And now it's like, oh, a click of the button, you can have a test instance that's all of your production data. And so I think you're right that really focusing on on how you're protecting all of that data when people can just replicate it trivially is a, a key thing to pay attention to. So let's look at the flip side. Like a lot of things we do because we've always done them. What's a practice that we really ought to have just killed off and buried a long time ago? Oh, I don't know if this counts as a practice necessarily, but as we do something new, it, it probably goes without saying that having a clear and compelling strategy to move forward and do what you want to do is really important. If you start with a strategy, it'll pay dividends, you'll reduce risk, you'll increase efficiency, you're probably going to save time and money, it's, it's probably going to turn out better, you're going to not be creating tech debt. So really yep. stepping into the cloud with a plan is just much better than playing around and looking at it as an opportunity to experiment and try new things. Yeah, I really like that because I think we we spent 20 years talking about tech debt. And so maybe it is the time to to stop accumulating it just because, oh, let's play with a fancy thing. I hadn't, I hadn't really thought about the, like just playing with something as being a source of technical debt. Yep, it certainly has proven to be in some cases. <laughs> yep. Yeah, so for you, what has been the biggest surprise or biggest growth driver for from the, coming from the cloud era? I'm not sure I've been surprised in any sort of big way at this point in time. I, I think it's it's really easy to look at cloud as one big thing, like the cloud. But you know, as I was saying earlier, software as a service is very different than platform as a service or infrastructure as a service. So I think when we simply talk about the cloud, I think it gets to a point of oversimplification that's probably doing more harm than good. Uh, yep. especially at higher levels of companies, you know, at the board regulators, everyone's asking, how are you securing the cloud, period. And I, right. so I, I think that oversimplification might be an opportunity for growth and for us to really be talking about the various components of the cloud a little bit differently in the future. Yeah, it's, I like that. It's really insightful. So let's look at your career. You've probably made learned some lessons, some of them the hard way. 
what's a piece of advice that you just wish you'd gotten earlier in your career? Yeah, I've been doing some more thinking about this more recently, but I, I would say ask for what you need or ask for what you want. And it sounds pretty basic, but early in my career, there were times where I assumed that, you know, well, they're my leader. They should know. They, they'll figure out eventually what I need, what I want. And while I've never, ever been called shy, I would say I wasted probably too much time thinking about why they weren't figuring it out. How should I ask them? When should I ask them? And, and now I see the value in not just asking for investment or the tangible things that you might need, but in asking for support finding yep. out who will be your advocates in the organization if you want to make a change and really asking for what you need to get something uh, completed, getting somebody to help you influence across the organization. So I wish I would have known that earlier. It probably would have smoothed the path on some difficult conversations that I had or helped somebody understand what it was that I needed so that yep. I could do my job better and be more successful. I like that. That's, and it's, it's sort of, I always love listening to those because sometimes I'm like, yeah, I wish I had learned that much earlier too. I think the, the thing I often had to learn was when to tell somebody that was you know, above me that I was just informing them so that if the opportunity came up for them to advocate, they could, but I didn't need them to solve a problem today. Yeah, that, that's a great one too. Yeah, that one, I had to actually learn that as the executive, if people would come to me and tell me something, I'm like, great, here's how to go solve it. And they're like, I, I just actually wanted to let you know that I'm on this. Yes. So as you look to the future, what opportunities about technology and what the future is going to bring have you most excited? Well, I, you know, I think anything that makes technology simple and can drive more people to contribute to the field, embrace the mindset of being a builder. Some of the things that we're hearing around citizen development is one example. I think that getting new perspectives of non-traditional technologists will mm -hmm. really bring some innovation in the way we get our work done, including how we think about information security as well. Yeah, I think that's gonna be really necessary in the sort of hybrid and distributed world that I suspect more of us are gonna stay in. Yep, absolutely. Uh, rather than all just, I love that. So end of the day, you know, CISO is a stressful job. What do you do to unwind, recharge your batteries? I, I do a lot of things. One of the things I did during the pandemic is starting to get outside more and, and walk. I walk four miles a day for about a year. I've given some mm -hmm. of that up as I've returned to the office and found my time stretched, um, yep. trying to advance my golf game. And then I started to volunteer for an organization called Lasagna Love. And so okay, I, I need to know about, more about this one. Yeah, I, I baked about 30 lasagnas last year and donated them to people who were in need for any reason. So it could have been that they had a, a sick family member. It could have been that they lost their job, any sort of food insecurity. It could have been that they were just super stressed out. And the thought of having somebody deliver a meal, it's really one neighbor to another. So yep. I, I really perfected some of my lasagna making skills and, and really enjoyed that. It was, it was wonderful just being able to deliver those lasagnas is pretty much touch free experience and just the, the gratitude was unbelievable. I love that. That, that actually may, has to be one of the coolest unwind things uh, I've heard, just feeding people. Yes, my kitchen was a mess, but, but I really enjoyed it. <laughs> I suspect it. it was. Okay, Freeform, give me a piece of wisdom. Doesn't have to be about technologies that our listeners could benefit from. Well, you know, at this point in my career, I, I spend more time probably reflecting on what I've I and my team have accomplished and all the people who have helped me. So I try to do my best to give back to the community. I mentor others. I try and build future CISOs and encourage my team leaders to do the same because I think building the future pipeline of talent, whether it's a result of shifting security truly to the left and helping engineers understand where the security team's coming from or helping those that are specializing in security, it's just something that we need to do as a community and as seasoned CISOs to really make sure that we have the cybersecurity talent that we're going to need in the future to, to make sure all these great things that we're building operate safely and securely. Yeah. I, you know, I really like that, especially because you can also sell it to people that it's tactically advantageous. If you develop the people around you, then you can get rid of the work that you don't want to do and you can advance in your career. 
that that's one way to look at it too. <laughs> yep. So Meg, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Andy. You've been listening to the Cloud Security Reinvented podcast. I'm your host, Andy Ellis, and I hope you have a lovely day. Thank you for checking out this episode of Cloud Security Reinvented, brought to you by Orca Security. Orca Security detects and prioritizes cloud security risks for AWS, Microsoft Azure, and Google Cloud without the gaps in coverage, alert fatigue, and operational costs of agents. Please follow Cloud Security Reinvented wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts or visit orca.security slash podcast to get immediate access to all of the latest episodes.